Welcome to the 2021 AIA Austin Design Excellence Conference, day two. I hope you had a productive day yesterday and I want to thank you for coming back for day two and our keynote session, Transforming Austin, a look at Austin's population growth and demographic shifts. I'm Steffi Motal, AIA Austin president, and I'm thrilled to welcome our honored speaker, Austin City demographer, Dr. Lila Valencia, as well as all of you to the second day of our conference. I wanna thank our keynote sponsor, Vectorworks, for their support of the conference and for their continuous support of AIA Austin. Let's watch a short video about Vectorworks. What would you do at design software that works the way you think? As the only BIM software specifically developed to support your entire design process, Vectorworks Architect connects your workflows from sketch to BIM. Freely sketch ideas with efficient, easy to use tools. Transform massing models into intelligent 3D models to drive the BIM process. Optimize information so it's easy to quantify and analyze. Create top quality drawings and renderings with the exact elements you need. Win competitions and impress even the toughest clients. Collaborate with others by importing data from multiple sources. You can share files with anyone, anywhere, whether it's a colleague down the hall or a client on the other side of the world. Discover design software that provides the solutions you need. No matter the project, big or small, local or global, Vectorworks Architect can help make your creative vision a reality. Awesome, and let me introduce Matthew Coleman from Vectorworks to say hello. Hey everybody, Matt Coolman from Vectorworks here, born and raised right here in Austin, Texas, for Vectorworks. And uh, if you use design software, you really owe it to yourself to try something new. Try Vectorworks, I urge you, and uh, message me for details. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Vectorworks, for sponsoring. And now our featured speaker, Dr. Lila Valencia. As Austin City Demographer, Dr. Valencia leads the, the Strategic Data Initiatives team at the Housing and Planning Department and produces population estimates and projections to support the planning and decision-making of city departments, local businesses, organizations, and the community at large. Dr. Valencia is an applied demographer with over 15 years of experience in quantitative and qualitative analysis in both the public and private sectors. Before her role at the city, she was a senior demographer at the Texas Demographic Center, where she monitored and reported demographic and socioeconomic trends to inform policymaking and planning for the state of Texas. She also oversaw product development for the center and led 2020 census coordination efforts with varying stakeholders across the state. Previously, Lila served as senior research analyst and complaint specialist at the city of Austin's office of the police monitor, where she fielded complaints of police misconduct allegations and produced analysis and annual reports documenting these allegations. Dr. Valencia holds a PhD in applied demography from the University of Texas at San Antonio, a master's from the College of William and Mary in Virginia, and a bachelor's degree from UT Austin. She has lived in Austin for over 25 years. Dr. Valencia, I'll pass the mic to you in just a minute, but I would like to remind our audience to please type your questions into the Q&A and I'll try to monitor both the Q&A and the chat, but the Q&A is preferable for questions. All right, thank you. Hello everyone. Um, let me go ahead and start to share my, uh, my presentation screen with you. And I'll bring that into presentation mode. Do you see my screen? We see your there. Yes. Perfect. Wonderful. OK, great. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to speak to you at your Design Excellence Conference. Um, I really appreciate um, looking through your Design Excellence goals 
And um, I hope that the information that I'm going to provide to you help to build upon some of that information and those goals that you're trying to move forward in the organization. Um, some of the data that I'll be sharing today are going to um, be looking at the present. Um, we've got the brand new 2020 census data coming uh, that just came out last week. So I'll share information with you about that. I'll share some um, demographic trends that we've seen in the last decade or so. And then I'll share a little bit of a historical perspective that really sort of takes a look back and asks, you know, how, how did we get here? Um, and then I think in, in closing, I will um, hopefully, you know, not have completely depressed you <laughs> and be able to shine some, uh, air, some light on some areas of opportunity uh, moving forward for the city. So let me go ahead and um, get started. So first I'll talk about Austin's population growth. As I mentioned, we just had the latest uh, 2020 census data reveal and it continue, and, and what it reveals about Austin is that we continue to grow. Uh, we have uh, now reached uh, 961,855 uh, people. Uh, if you can see this chart, historically, the city of Austin has been doubling in size about, about every 20 to 25 years. In 2020, we we're at 961,000. If you look back just um, at 1970, we will have quadrupled, nearly quadrupled that population size in, that, in 50 years. So the growth in Austin is very strong and it continues. I know that uh, for some of you who do keep track of these numbers, uh, this official 2020 census count may look a little bit lower than uh, we've been seeing in the past. Um, these are our official counts. Um, so this is what I'm reporting, but we'll definitely, um, I'll get into more detail about sort of why we're seeing sort of a, a slower growth in the city of Austin and explain a little bit more about what we're finding. Now here is the city of Austin in, in comparison to the other top 10 largest cities in the country. The city of Austin is um, number 11. And what you can see here though, is that between 2010 and 2020, according to these latest census numbers, only two other cities added more people than the city of Austin. And those cities were New York and Houston. Now these cities are huge cities, right? And these are world renowned cities. And here is little old Austin, of course, not so little, but really keeping pace with the growth that's being added by these two very large metropolitan areas and, and cities. Uh, we added about 171,000 people in the last decade. Only um, New York, Houston, and Fort Worth is not listed here because it's not in top 11, but they did also add uh, a few more people than we did. Austin was the fastest growing metro in the country every year this decade. Um, these are the data um, looking just at the 2010-2020 bookmarks. And what you can see is that we were growing at, as a metro region at about 33% this last decade. And you can see that we've been leading uh, amongst fairly large uh, metro areas like Houston and Dallas, but also some more similarly sized um, areas like uh, Orlando and uh, Charlotte and Seattle. As Austin is seeing this lo these large gains, these large numerical gains, we are not growing even as fast as our uh, immediate neighbors. There are so many um, suburban cities right uh, in along the perimeter of the city of Austin. And for as fast as we're growing, they're growing even faster. A number of these central Texas cities have been among the fastest growing cities in the country this last decade, including Leander and Cedar Park. But on this list, you can also see, you know, smaller cities like Maynard and Buda and Hutto really also showing very strong growth. So what is driving a lot of this growth in the city of Austin to the city of Austin? And this looks at the metro region. But what we're seeing is that a lot of migration has been driving growth in the city of Austin. Um, these data look at the change between 2019 and 2020. So given our new 2020 census figures, these might be a little bit lower, but the trend I believe still holds. And so what we can see is that nearly three quarters of the growth that we're seeing in the last uh, year was driven by people moving to the, to the metro area. 
Now, domestic migration doesn't only mean people moving from other states to the, uh, to the state of Texas and to the Austin metro area. It also includes people from other areas in the state of Texas. Uh, then you can see about 20% of the growth is coming from natural increase. And so these are all the brand new little native Texans, brand new little uh, Austinites that we're adding to the population. This is the net of births minus deaths. And then about 6% of our growth in the last year can be attributed to international migration. We've seen some um, drops in the share of natural increase and international migration and continue to see domestic migration being a major driver of growth in the metro area. Now let's look a little bit closer as to where exactly are people moving from when they're moving to Austin. This is something that we get asked a lot. And this looks just at the city of Austin, not the region. But what we're seeing is that for the most part of all of the people that moved, and that's about 22%, um, we see that a lot of them are moving within Travis County. And with a, over 25 different municipalities that are wholly or partially within Travis County, it's easy to imagine how those moves could take place within that same area. Another, uh, this is about 60%, another 20% of movers are coming from different uh, counties in the state of Texas. And then I'll show you where those uh, counties are in the next slide. But now we see that about 14% of the share is coming from people moving from other states. And I really wanna highlight this because yes, I know we all like to blame Californians for prices of housing going up in the city of Austin and, and, and additional congestion and lots of other things. But this really, they really do make up a, a, you know, a smaller share of all of the people that are moving um, to the city of Austin. And then of course we see about 6% of international migration. Now here we're looking at the county level. This is the, the smallest geography that these data are available at. But what we're seeing is, is that Travis County is losing population to surrounding counties. And those counties typically happen to be counties that are in the, in the same Austin metro region. And so we see highlighted Williamson County, Hayes County, Bastrop County, Caldwell, Burnett, all of these uh, regional counties have a, a negative net migration. This means that Travis County is sending more people to these counties than they are receiving from Travis County. Uh, in fact, Williamson County is a big, the biggest recipient of movers from Travis County. But we're gaining from other parts of Texas. And here you can see exactly what parts of Texas are sending people to Austin and to Travis County. We see um, large contributions from Harris County, where Houston is, from Bear County and Dallas County. Uh, we also see Tarrant, where Fort Worth is located. And then as we start to look at other um, senders to the city of Austin and Travis County, we see that other states do start to pop up. So we start to see Los Angeles County being a big sender. But we also see senders from other countries and other parts of the world. So we see Asian countries being a major contributor to the growth in Austin, uh, Central American counties as well, or countries as well. With all of this movement of the population, we do start to see um, a change in the makeup of the community. And this um, last decade, the latest census data, what they reveal is that populations of color were really driving the growth of cities in the US and in the state of Texas. When we see uh, what's happening in Austin, we see that we have a unique pattern of diversity taking place in Austin. The city's population growth of over 171,000 people in this last decade extended across all race and ethnicity groups. So all race ethnic groups grew this last decade. We didn't see any population declines. However, what we saw, uh, and we also see that no racial ethnic group holds a majority or over 50% of the population. But what we do see is that the non-Hispanic white population continues to make up the largest share of the city of Austin's total population at 47%. Now, this was a slight drop from about 49% in 2010. The Hispanic population also saw a decrease in its share 
of about three percentage points from 2010. It now makes up 32% of the city's population. The Asian population is now the third largest race ethnicity group in the city, and it makes up nearly 10% of the total population, up from about 6% in 2010. The Black population now makes up about 7% of the total population, and this is a one percentage decline from the start of the decade or from, uh, from 2010. We also see um, that the two or more races or the multiracial um, category has uh, reached a, a level of about 4% of total population uh, in the city of Austin. And this is a significant share of the population and one of the fastest growing uh, race and ethnicity groups. And I'll, I'll share a little bit more information on that in the next slide. So here what we can see is that in Austin, um, if you look at the second to last line of this, um, of this table, we see the growth of the non-Hispanic white population at nearly 40%. They, um, this is not the rate of growth. Their rate of growth was about 17%, but this is the um, contribution of the total change in the city of Austin between 2010 and 2020. And so this, the non-Hispanic white population was a major driver of the growth of the city of Austin in this last decade. Now, this is during a time when the country as a whole experienced a decline for the first time in 230 years of people identifying as non-Hispanic white. So seeing such strong non-Hispanic white driven growth in the Austin community is pretty significant. Another uh, line that I want to draw your attention to in this table is um, the Asian population. They were the fastest growing single race um, group in, in, this, in the city of Austin. They grew at a rate of about 75% and they made up over 20% of the total growth in the last decade. So of every, uh, every five people that moved to the city of Austin or that were added to the city of Austin, one of them was of Asian descent. Another fast um, growing race ethnicity group is the multiracial group or the two or more races group. This um, growth is a trend that we've seen in the past. Um, so we knew that it was a fast growing uh, race ethnicity category, but what makes it pretty significant is that it really increased its rate in, in, um, in growth and it now makes up about 4% of the total population. Some of this um, change between 2010 and 2020 can be attributed to changes in the way the Census Bureau did some of its coding, but a lot of it does come from more and more people really opting to not just pick one box and instead um, really wanting to be more expressive and more, um, explicit about how they self-identify. And it's not in the typical dichotomous way that we typically see or have seen when we look at survey data like this. And then lastly, I wanna draw your attention to the Hispanic population. They made up about 20% of the growth in the city in the last decade. And this compares with about 50% at the national and state level. And so the Hispanic population in the city of Austin is growing, but it's growing at a much slower rate than it is in other parts of, of the country and the state. And then also I wanna note that the African-American population continues to grow, but it's growing at a, at a relatively low, uh, slow rate of growth. And we saw data in other uh, cities in the state, as well as other cities in the South, that really uh, where African-Americans were making great contributions, including the city of Dallas and the city of Houston. And so I think with, when we look at this table, um, you know, we wanna recognize that there is a lot to be celebrated. Uh, we're growing uh, more and, you know, than most large cities in the state of Texas, um, only a few uh, Texas cities and, and one other uh, major city in the country grew more than the city of Austin. Our Asian population is thriving. Uh, but what we do want to note is that what's happening in Austin is a little bit different, in particular for the African-American population and for the Hispanic population. And so I think it's important for us to also um, you know, reflect on why we may be seeing some of, this, uh, some of these different trends. 
And so a lot of times when we want to understand sort of uh, what's to come in our demographic future, we tend to look at the child population. And so these um, sets of data provided information on the voting age population and the total population. And so at, when we look at the residual, we're able to look at the child population. And what we see is that the child population is much more diverse than the adult population. The adult population looks very similar to the total population as a whole, with the exception that the non-Hispanic white uh, in the adult population does make up at least just over 50% of the, of the share of the, the total population. So there is a um, you know, specific majority group when we look at the adult population in the city of Austin. When we look at the child population, non-Hispanic white population makes up about 33%. So about 67% of the child population is, is non-white. So it's much more diverse than uh, the total population for the city. However, one thing that we looked at was comparing the 2020 child population by race and ethnicity with the 2010. And what we noticed was similar with the adult population, the non-Hispanic white population, the Asian population in particular, and the multiracial race ethnicity group really drove growth in the child population. And we actually saw declines in the number of African-American and Hispanic children. Now, this is, this is also not a typical pattern for the most part, especially among Hispanics with, um, who tend to have slightly higher uh, fertility rates. We really see the Hispanic population making up a a much larger share of the child population and really driving their growth. In the case of Austin, we actually saw uh, a decline both for Hispanics and for African-American children. So let's talk a little bit more about where Austin Nights come from because I think a lot of times when we start to look at um, racial and ethnic makeup, we start to make assumptions about, you know, well, these people must be from different places, or I wonder where they're from. And so, you know, we break down the data as, as far as we can here by um, looking at um, where are Austinites born. And so we can't tell you if they're born in Austin. And so a shout out to, to Matthew uh, for his Austinite status. I, I do think that that, you know, um, that population is definitely uh, also probably shrinking in size. And that's not something that we can see from these data, unfortunately, but it's something that we're working to, to understand a little bit better through other um, sources of data. But what we do see here is that the share of Austin residents born uh, in Texas uh, makes up the majority of the, the population of, or, or the uh, place of origin where people in Austin are, are born. So most are born in the state of Texas. Um, however, we have seen a decline in that share. So compared to 55% in 2010, in 2019, we see that Texans uh, make up about 49% of those that live in the city of Austin. We see that the foreign born uh, population in Austin or people who are from other countries um, has remained relatively stable uh, in between 2010 and 2019. We've seen the largest increases in those uh, Austin residents who moved from another state. That share has increased from about 26% to about 31%. And so I wanna focus a little bit more on the diversity of the foreign born population in the city, because um, even though you know, we may start to look at some of these numbers, maybe see some of the lower shares for the Hispanic population, the African-American population, um, what I what I want to, you to take away is that the Austin population continues to be very diverse. The, the foreign born population, and, and I guess diverse in a way that you know those pie charts don't don't really reflect. And the foreign born population in Austin, which makes is about 192,000 people, about 66,000 um, who are naturalized citizens. Um, come from all, you know, about six continents and over a hundred different countries. And so here you can see the top 20 countries um, of origin for the foreign born population in the city of Austin. And so you can see, right, of course, you see Mexico and Central American countries, but you also see a lot of different Asian uh, countries as well as Middle Eastern and, and North African countries. 
And when we look at the languages that are spoken in the city of Austin, we see that there's over 40 uh, different languages spoken by uh, Austin residents. And here I share with you the top 10 languages. So other than, than English, we've got um, Spanish and uh, Asian languages like Chinese, uh, Mandarin, Telugu, and Hindi, uh, mostly spoken in, in, in India, in Arabic, and um, other uh, uh, languages, including Vietnamese, French, uh, Korean, uh, Nepali, Marathi, and, and other Indic languages. So the um, foreign born population in Austin is, is still itself also very diverse and has a varied um, number of languages that they, that they speak. So now let's take a little bit of a look at areas of growth. And these, these are numbers that we're still um, looking through. And so I'm gonna share with you just um, sort of a quick comparison of where we were in 2010, where we are in, in 2020. Um, the, this map is probably not the easiest to look at, but we're developing some tools that are gonna be a little bit more interactive uh, and you'll be able to zoom in and, and look at your neighborhoods. And I'll be sure to share those with AIA Austin as soon as we uh, have those available. But on the left, you'll see the map that looks at the 2020, um, sorry, the 2010 census blocks. And then on the right, you have the map that has the census 2020 uh, blocks. And you are looking here at population density. So the more densely populated areas are going to be darker in color and uh, bright pink in some areas. And uh, what we can see from these maps, and I'll go through some areas because um, you know some of the information is, may not be uh, very clear, but what, what we're finding is, is that there is an increased density uh, along the I-35 corridor. So there is increased density along that corridor. And, and this is something um, that has been intentional in part, right? We, we've been developing uh, a lot there. We've been uh, putting more uh, uh, transportation uh, corridors and connections um, through that, um, through that uh, I-35 uh, area. And we are seeing that increased density in those uh, census blocks. However, we are also seeing increased densities. If you look to the Northwest, um, the area of Avery Ranch and um, Pond Springs and Anderson Mill, you'll see increased density in darker shades of, of pink in the 2020 map compared to the 2010 map. You'll also see some additional density in the area around Tech Ridge. And then you'll also see some increased density towards the southwest uh, part of the city uh, around the um, Circle C area and um, farther south to, towards Slaughter. So this is just a quick um, sort of snap view, right, of, of where we are seeing some of that growth. And now I want to share with you the uprooted study, which I think many of you are familiar with. Um, that was a study um, done by uh, researchers at the University of, of Texas, where they looked at displacement in uh, Austin's gentrifying neighborhoods. And, and I want to call out just a couple of neighborhoods here. Uh, and, and I'll go back really quickly because I didn't point them out in this slide. But the area, and let me see if I can bring my little highlighter here or my laser pointer. But the area that I want to show you is this area of St. John's and Coronado Hills in uh, 2010 and compare that to 2020. And you can see that increase in density in that area as well. And now if we go farther south, to the area of Montopolis, we can see that there is increased density in that area of Montopolis as well. And now I'll um, turn off my little laser pointer if I can here. And take you to the next slide. These are a couple of um, census tracts that this study um, sort of pulled out to look at sort of in, in, in terms of um, in terms of additional focus. And so this is the Coronado Hills and St. John's area, and this is the Montopolis area. And you'll see that they were labeled as early type one for Montopolis, part of St. John's was early type one, and then susceptible um, in the light purple. Now we see that those areas have increased in density. And so that starts to suggest to us as we you know, explore um, the data further that, the, that you know, what these researchers were um, 
predicting might happen and, and these categories of gentrification may in fact be starting to take place. And so I think um, I, my recommendation would be you know, for us to continue to look at some of these other susceptible areas. Um, I know Easton Park development should be right around here. Um, the Colony Park development right around here, um, Whisper Valley over in this area. These are all areas that are of course already um, designated and probably in part as susceptible um, and we, you know, should probably um, begin to consider, you know, what what will happen there as this development goes underway and and starts to um, be built out, and what can be done um, when we are engaging in that um, in that development, and what might be the the outcomes of of that growth. Now, I'm going to share with you some similar maps, but we look at the race ethnicity um, share of population. So here. I'm gonna look at the um, geographic distribution of the percent of the Asian population by blocks. And what you'll see in this set of maps, again, 2010 on the left, 2020 on the right, is an increased density uh, of or concentration of the Asian population in the Northwest parts of the city. So we see additional, um, high increased shares of growth of the Asian community in the Avery Ranch area and the Lake Line area, as well as the Anderson Mill area. When we move over to the um, Tech Ridge area and really uh, farther south, closer to the Pioneer Crossing uh, area, we start to see also some additional um, increases in share in that area. And when we look farther southwest, we start to see increases in shares of the, Afri of the uh, um, Asian population along uh, Barton Creek and um, in, in the Circle C area there as well. This next set of maps looks at the share of the African-American population, 2010 on the left, 2020 on the right, and um, the decrease in the shares of the African-American population uh, by blocks uh, the, the lightning of that purple color is, is pretty pronounced. Um, and where you see those, um, those drops, and I'll, I'll pull up my little pointer again, are going to be, of course, in this historic uh, Central Austin, uh, Af historic African-American uh, neighborhoods, uh, even parts farther out to the east uh, in MLK. When we look at the LBJ area, we now start to see all of these areas have significantly lower shares of African-American uh, population. On the next slide, I share a similar map for the Hispanic population. And for the Hispanic population, what we're seeing is um, uh, the Eastern Crescent sort of moving even farther east and farther, uh, farther apart. So, so an Eastern um, sprawl of the Hispanic population. And so we start to see, um, let me bring up my pointer. So we start to see um, some increased uh, density in the um, share of the Hispanic population in areas around uh, Windsor Hills and um, we see a, in, an increased um, share of the population that's Hispanic and even in, uh, higher increase in the share than we were seeing in the North Lamar area. And then we start to see uh, some increased um, shares in the farther east of the airport than we saw in 2010. And then we start to see um, significant drops in the share of the Hispanic population in historic uh, East Austin, we see uh, much lighter shades of orange there. And we also start to see that in the Montopolis area where we used to have higher concentrations of Hispanic population. We are now seeing those areas also start to turn uh, a little bit lighter orange, uh, lower shares of Hispanic population there. And the non-Hispanic white population, this population map is a little bit interesting because in 2020 and in 2010 compared to 2020, I think what we would have expected was an increase uh, 
in the share of the uh, non-Hispanic white population all along the west part of the city, but instead what we're seeing is also a decrease in the share. And so you can see that in the in the lower, uh, the lighter shades of blue in, in the Four Points area, in Spicewood, in Avery Ranch, uh, of course, a lot of that has to do with the dynamic population growth of the Asian population as well. But what we're seeing is um, a, a move into the central corridor for the non-Hispanic white population. And in particular, I'll draw your attention to the greater shades of white in the 2010 um, map in the eastern part of the city compared to the less um, shades of white in that same area in the 2020 maps. So the non-Hispanic white population appear in, 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 is increasing in share in blocks that are farther and farther east uh, in, the, in the city. As we start to look at these um, changes in our demographic makeup, um, we start to, to wonder, you know, well, what else is happening? Well, how, how else is our city changing? And one of the things that we're, that we're seeing and we have been seeing for a while now is that Austin households are becoming more affluent, uh, are becoming more affluent. And of course, you know, at, at first that, that looks like a good thing, right? Uh, when, especially when we're looking at this income distribution here, we're seeing that in, in 2019, we have less households that have, or fewer households that have um, incomes between 10 to $14,000, uh, you know, lower than $25,000 um, a year. And, and so we think, well, that's, that's good. You know, Austin households must be doing better. And we see increases in the share of households that are making more than 200,000 or 150,000 or more, in particular 100,000 or more. But instead, what we, uh, when we sort of disaggregate these data by race and ethnicity, we see that there are still huge uh, disparities when we look at the incomes. And so we see here that the median household income in 2019 for Austin was about 75,000. Um, but we see that it's much higher for um, Asian population households as well as non-Hispanic white households, whereas for Hispanic and African-American households, this um, is much lower, about uh, 55,000 for Hispanics and about 50,000 for African-Americans. And when we look at, uh, we know that incomes are directly connected with um, housing and the ability to especially obtain home ownership. And so here we see that, um, you know, the housing cost burden has gone down between 2010 and, and 2019, but there are still great disparities between renters and, and homeowners. Nearly half of the renters are experiencing uh, housing cost burden. And additionally, we see that severe housing cost burden is disproportionately affecting even lower uh, income and, and renters. And so we, when we look at um, nearly a quarter of renters in Austin were severely housing cost burden in 2019. We also see higher cost burdens among households that have the lowest incomes, suggesting that already financially burdened households are feeling a much greater weight of these housing prices. So how do these trends affect different race and ethnicities in the Austin metro area? Well, Austin has you know, some of the highest incomes of any of the large metros in the state. And uh, between 2010 and 2019, incomes rose by over 25,000. However, when we disaggregate those by race and ethnicity, we see that um, Austin's not very unique in terms of racial and ethnic disparities when we look at other metro areas and compare ourselves to them. And again, we see that Asian and non-Hispanic white populations have, have higher median incomes, and they also saw the biggest increases during the decade. By comparison, Hispanics and African-Americans have lower incomes and saw smaller increases during the decade. Uh, lower incomes uh, increase the vulnerability of African-Americans and Hispanics, especially during times like COVID and, and the economic challenges that we are experiencing right now. But they also add barriers to home ownership, which of course is a major source of wealth in, in our country. And so here we're looking at changes in, in home ownership rate and renter rates between 2010 and 2020, uh, I'm sorry, in 2019. And what we can see is that non-Hispanic whites and Asians 
have the highest home ownership rates among the race ethnicity groups. Uh, in contrast, the majority of African Americans and Hispanics in Austin in, are renters. And although home ownership uh, rents have increased for Asians and Hispanics, home ownership rates have, have actually dropped both for non-Hispanic whites and for blacks. However, home ownership rates overall for non-Hispanic whites are at 64% are much higher than they are for African Americans at 39%. And in fact, the gap between uh, black and white home ownership has increased between 2010 and 2019, even with that slight drop in white home ownership. So some researchers worry also that increases in Hispanic ownership could be threatened by the current state of, um, of, of, of housing prices in the city of Austin, but also by the disproportionate um, impact of COVID-19, not being able to compete in such a tight market and also being more disproportionately affected economically by the pandemic. Um, so, so these disparities in home ownership have existed, of course, long before this decade, right? Uh, and so, you know, what, what could be behind some of this? And this uh, part of the question is, is how did we get here? Uh, and there was a study, let me go back from just one slide. There, there was a study that, that looked at, um, I'm sorry, maybe I didn't include it here. But there was a study uh, out of the Urban Institute that really that looked into the differences in home ownership between African Americans and non Hispanic whites in particular. And absolutely, there were definite um, socioeconomic uh, characteristics, household characteristics that were associated with home ownership. So, not having the savings to be able to uh, put down a, um, a down payment, uh, not having um, uh, support from other family members to be able to, to help with the covering of those down payments, um, differences in credit scores. But there was about 15% difference that the researchers could not explain with socioeconomic uh, characteristics alone. And what they suggested was that there were systemic inequities, inequities that were really behind much of this inexplicable um, part of that of that gap of in home ownership between African Americans and Blacks. And so I think in the last few minutes that I have here, what I want to do is to just take a little bit of a look back, right? Um, in demography, we talk a lot about demographic um, destiny, uh, demographics and destiny. And um, one of the things that it's helpful to do is to look at Austin through that lens and try to understand that what we're seeing in some of these maps and what we are seeing in the shifts in our race and ethnicity, in part, um, perhaps maybe even 15%, right, um, can be explained through some of, um, of the destiny that we started to write well at the founding of the city of Austin. And so here is the city of Austin plan. Um, we see in, 19, in 1839, um, there was a population of about 553 people the plan, of course, had um, allocated land to the future capital, uh, four public squares, a courthouse, a jail, a penitentiary, and uh, hospitals and, and an armory. As we move forward, we see uh, Austin here nestled between the Edwards Plateau and the Blackland Prairie to the, to the east. And these may be maps uh, that you may have seen before, historical uh, maps. But what you what I'll draw your attention to is um, right in the in the center, you can see the, the Capitol building and then farther north, you see the University of Texas, uh, the original 40 acres. And then over in the corner, we see uh, the beginnings of, of Hyde Park, the, the plans for uh, Hyde Park. And we also know that Austin, um, after the Civil War, also um, brought and had a lot of African Americans um, moving to the area and building these freedmen's communities where they were buying land, sometimes from former slave owners, and communities such as, as Clarksville and Wheatville and Kinchinville, Mason Town, Gregory Town are some of the ones that are, that are listed here in, in this map. And you can see some of the buildings here in Clarksville, some of them still um, preserved to, to this day. And um, so the African-American population in Austin from the very beginning was a, a thriving population. 
Here you also see um, the Hispanic uh, population. This is uh, the first ward in the original uh, plan for Austin. And this was an area where a lot of Hispanics um, perhaps already were and, and, and some uh, boundaries um, were crossed over their communities, but there was also migration from Hispanics, uh, in particular Mexicans who were moving to the area to work in agriculture. And so you can see here um, the, the picture of this um, Hispanic community in the city of Austin. And then of course we have um, the Austin 1928 master plan. Um, in uh, the former, the pictures that I showed to you previously, there, there were communities of Hispanics and African-Americans sort of pretty much dispersed throughout the community. Um, obviously not, you know, living, you know, amongst in, 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 in equal ways uh, of non-Hispanic white populations, but in the same area to be able to um, do the, the household um, labor, the, um, you know, field labor that was necessary, but the communities were much more integrated. And with racial, with racial zoning uh, being declared unconstitutional, uh, Austin moved forward with a plan um, developed here by Cook and Fowler that reduced, um, in essence, or you know, the way that it was phrased, it, it reduced the duplication of services um, because we had still the um, duplication of services that were brought about by separate but equal uh, provisions. And so um, their plan suggested, well, we can reduce this, uh, this duplicity or this duplication by uh, moving the, assigning a Negro district over in East Austin, where we can provide services separately there, but equally as well. And um, this also, this plan um, had other um, measures in place, but one of the other things it ensured was that most of the industry and some harmful industry would also be taking place in parts of East Austin. And this really laid the groundwork for redlining uh, in, in Austin. The population then was 53,000, uh, about 80 or 70% of the population, 72% was non-Hispanic white, followed by uh, African-American population of about 9%. Uh, um, Mexican population, and this was the first time that um, they were separated as other um, and as opposed to being counted with white, and um, they made up about 20% of the population. And then you see about uh, a very small fraction of, of the population of uh, Asian population, but this is also one of the first times that we start to see in the census data, um, the Asian population being documented in the city of Austin. And of course, much of the uh, movement to the east uh, was negatively reinforced by imposing a, a, deny, a denial of services if, if the migration did not take place. And so here uh, we look at the uh, redlining maps that of course we're, many of us are familiar with. But when we start to look at that gap between black and white home ownership, um, we see that it's, it's the highest that it's been in about 50 years. Uh, and like I explained earlier, only partially uh, can, can that gap be explained by socioeconomic factors. And so um, these other studies really suggest that it's these efforts, the beginning of these, uh, this 1928 plan uh, and uh, this uh, redlining efforts that really start to write that demographic destiny for the city of Austin. And so here, of course, the redlining, uh, what, what this meant was that the Homeowners Loan Corporation was going to outline for the federal government and for banks where it was safe, uh, deemed safe to provide home loans. And so these areas that were deemed unsafe um, very largely overlapped with areas um, where African-Americans and um, also uh, areas of um, Mexican populations were uh, more concentrated, where they of course had, had been asked to move to, but also including areas such as Clarksville uh, that were still those uh, historic freedmen's communities. And so when we start to take in other policies um, such as you know, racially restrictive uh, covenants that um, help to you know, protect Hyde Park um, in, in the, the way of life uh, in, in neighborhoods like Hyde Park uh, in the city of Austin, but also racially segregated federal housing policies. Here I show you a picture of the Santa Rita courts in 1939. Uh, this is the first uh, public housing um, 
established in the U.S. and it was here in the city of Austin. Uh, when we share, um, when we, you know, when we see that racial um, segregation in that federal housing policy, as well as um, eminent domain uh, acquisitions brought about through the urban renewal and even below the picture of Santa Rita, we see pictures of little African-American children in front of this house uh, posing for a photo, uh, of course, that uh, a gentleman is, um, is, is taking to make sure that they are able to get uh, the fullest value for that property that is going to soon be um, demolished and uh, renewed. And um, the Urban Renewal uh, or the Housing Act of 1949, of course, had very, um, you know, seemingly good goals, right? It was about rebuilding cities and removing slums and, and blight. But instead, what we saw was that much of that removal did not result in the provision of new services for those same communities. Uh, but instead, much of that went to um, suburban neighborhoods um, that really allowed for the uh, white flight out of the central cities and really following um, the, the World War II uh, migration of um, soldiers coming back home, building families, and then the white flight that took place out to the suburbs. Uh, when you pair that with um, you know, more, of 90, more than 98% of these uh, home loans went to suburban homeowners during that time, rather than to rebuild some of this inner city housing. And then of course we see um, the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956 that literally cemented the, the, the barrier, the, you know, the distance between the black and brown communities from the rest of the city. Then that, that demographic destiny you know, is really, is really you know, continuing to build upon itself. And so here, we show a, a dot density matrix, and, and you are probably familiar with this map as well. It comes from Austin Restricted by um, researcher Treader. I'm sorry, the journalist Treader. And so what you're, what you're looking at here is a dot density map of racial identification from the, at the census block levels that looks at the white population in blue, black in pink, Hispanic in brown, and then of course, East Avenue or I-35. And what you can see is that many of those same areas that were redlined um, continue to be um, highly uh, concentrated areas of African Americans and Hispanics. But as we start to, you know, these um, new policies start to take place and really build upon themselves, um, you start to see a diminishing of those uh, populations. And I'll share really quickly a quote from the uprooted study from the researchers at UT Austin uh, on displacement. And, and they describe displacement as having two dimensions. Um, one that looks at the stability of a neighborhood's residential community, and then the harder to define culture or character of the neighborhood. And then cultural displacement they define as of course occurs through both the loss of community of residents, but also a loss of the features that gave that place social meaning and allowed the residents to continue to live there in similar ways. And when many of those landmarks and, um, and, and you know, other icons of, of symbology are removed, then even the folks that remain find it a little bit of an alien place to be. And here's a quote from Wilhelmina Delco, the Honorable Wilhelmina Delco in, in the book, uh, Fault Lines. And what she says is, what I fear most is that one day my grandchildren and great-grandchildren We'll never know that a thriving Black community ever existed in East Austin. And so as we move forward to more contemporary plans, I you know, ask you to consider sort of this issue of displacement, right? Not just the physical movement of, of bodies, but also the symbology. And so you know, right now, one of the key um, focal points in the uh, Palm District, of course, is the, is the Palm School originally founded uh, and, and um, it, it was a, a school for um, Mexican-American community. Of course, I-35 cut that community's connection to the school and then um, the, the Palm School was closed in the 70s and uh, moved to Sanchez Elementary. Right across the street from the Palm School, of course, is a little less known um, uh, location. Um, now, you may, many of you may recognize this as the IHOP there at um, Cesar Chavez, or the, and, and, but this was Juarez Lincoln, and it was one of the first institutions of higher learning in the country 
for, for Mexican Americans and Chicanos. It was founded in 71, moved to this location in 75, and then of course closed in 1979 to much protest. Um, this is a, a, an image of the mural that was on the wall of one of the, of the Juarez Lincoln School um, by Raul Valdez. And so as we continue to um, move forward these, these new plans, and, uh, and, and I'm not suggesting that the Palm you know, plan will displace people. I'm suggesting that we should stop and take a moment to really consider. Um, and I think that this conference is doing exactly that. I think that you are starting that conversation. And I think that the, where I see hope Right is that you know we look at those maps and we see sort of the shrinking shares of both the African American population and the Hispanic population. But I don't think all hope is lost. I think that what you're doing here is starting that conversation. And I think that for all of these plans that are will be moving forward, the key to maintaining that um, that communication is going to be the most important. And so of course through meaningful and intentional community engagement which I think uh, many of these plans are incorporating into their work. And then lastly, I'm just going to, um, I put here a link in, um, in, in this slide for you to sort of um, try at home. Um, it's basically a, a native land acknowledgement um, from the um, Native Land Digital in, in Canada nonprofit. And it's a really cool application and looks at the entire um, globe. And you are able to search your address I searched the uh, AIA Austin building at 801 West 12th Street. And I just wanna mention and acknowledge and, and um, revere that um, we are sitting in the lands and territories of the Humanos, Ponkawa, Lipan, Apache, Kowaltikan, and the Comanche uh, lands and territories. So with that, I will um, end my presentation and uh, hopefully we have some time for questions. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Valencia. And thanks to everyone for attending. And of course, as always, a special thank you to our sponsor for this session, VectorWorks. Um, we do have a few seconds for questions, but I wanna take a mention um, to encourage you to visit our sponsors and ex expo area, as well as the event game. There is a $50 Visa gift card up for grabs. So enjoy your conference today and we'll take a few questions. I saw that John Niefler asked one early on, um, how will this data influence the redrawing of the Austin Council districts and who will prepare those new maps? The, the way that it will impact is that they do, they, they, they have to use these new data, right? And so um, they'll be able to um, make use of this data. They have um, hired a, who will be making this decision? It's the independent, uh, Citizens Redistricting Commission. Um, the city does not in, involve itself in that work. Um, they've hired their own uh, redistricting um, analysts that will help them through the technical aspects of that. And I, am, I believe also legal counsel to help them uh, maneuver those uh, decisions. But yes, absolutely, these data are for those purposes. Steph, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Kit had asked for the link that you mentioned, and thank you for sharing that. It is in the chat um, for, for that address. Um, David Goujon left a message in chat. Let me just make sure I'm not missing any other questions. Um, it, mostly he was expressing a lot of appreciation um, for, for your presentation, which I know is uh, resounding from all of the audience this morning. Um, we do have a new question coming in. We have like one minute left. Why is um, level of education not included as per race and ethnic groups? Um, so I didn't share it. I absolutely have it. And you'll see many of the same disparities that we see in household incomes. Those, those variables are very closely um, tied together. Uh, and then as, as migration impacts uh, Austin, we start to see increases in educational attainment, and they're not necessarily uh, educational gains that, that we're um, it, it providing, but that are being moved into the area as well. Okay. 
Well, thank you again. Thanks for everyone for coming. We really appreciate this talk. Thank you. Bye.